the um, name of this uh, talk is uh, Bringing Love, Wisdom, and Creative Intelligence Together, Macrocosmically and Microcosmically. Well, I think we have a whole lot to say about the microcosm, but maybe not so much about the macrocosm, although, hmm, we can help. Um, so this is very much a task as we apply ourselves. Am I echoing? Okay. I'm going to hear my own words, and this is difficult. Okay. Maybe if I stand back. Will that help a little? Okay, no problem then. So we have to be the uh, master of our energy system to a certain extent. I mastered energy, energy itself I am, something of that nature from the fifth ray. And of course, the whole question of initiation comes under the fifth ray. And you know well that Aquarius is uh, bringing in through its own quality the fifth ray. The seventh ray is an independent cycle. It could be Aquarius 1, Aquarius 2, Aquarius 3, whatever, and not necessarily in order. It just so happens that the seventh ray is accompanying this 2,500-year time of Aquarius. So fifth ray in Aquarius and seventh ray, it'll be a magical time, you know, and we'll really have to be specific about dealing with energy. I always think that there is a, a, a kind of a fifth force psychology, not just the fourth force of the transpersonal, but the fifth force of actually knowing what energies you're really dealing with and in a very specific manner. So that's where our sharp you know, analytical, occult, Uranian mind comes into the picture. We have to, uh, it is the science of occultism after all, and it has to win the day, says HPB, by the end of this century. So I'm sure many of us will be back helping it win the day, you know. And that will mean that, of course, uh, humanity will pay attention as a matter of fact, uh, I can see where this talk is going. Nowhere near like what's here, okay? <laughs> okay. Well, and on page 699 of Externalization, uh, she basically tells us a really important thing, that we have the five planetary centers, and somehow the masters are really going to locate themselves there. And they'll be surrounded by their initiates and by their disciples. And the most amazing thing of all is that <coughs> the uh, local governments and the, uh, the areas over which these planetary centers preside will be asking these masters for advice because they will have proven themselves to be so intelligent and understanding and accurate. So, that, you know, and how long will that take, huh? But uh, maybe if we uh, reach a sufficient crisis. I remember once reading in the books where it said, uh, um, humanity it will discover, humanity itself will discover that it cannot solve its problems unaided. A, a good attempt will be made, but unaided, I guess things will get quite severe that alone it cannot solve its problems. Then he gives this tantalizing idea, we know what will happen, but we're not going to say. Essentially like that. He says, we know what will happen. And probably these are the very big things, OK? And it, it, it looks like we're up against it in this, in this um, transition time from, Aquaria, from Pisces to Aquarius, the last um, fading out of the sixth ray on a particular cycle, a lower cycle, and of the sign Pisces. So, uh, you know, this incarnation, I think for many people in the West, has been a breather. I don't think it will be that in the next incarnation. And I think that uh, the way the hierarchy works, 
it forces out of us every little bit that it can get. Now I've covered one sentence. Okay. So we have a, a particular task on our second ray, third ray planet. I'm not even considering the first ray monad of our planet. It's interesting and it probably really operates on many different levels and uh, nature is green, right? But it's red in tooth and claw, as has been said. Nature is red in tooth and claw. So, the, you know, we have these complementary colors operating and the first ray really does operate. But until we get this um, fusion of the great second principle of unity and love and right human relations, we can't even think much about what we can do with the monad, you know. Maybe a few people are stretching into it, but it's not, it's, it's, for the general public, it's not the thing. But, you know, for us, in our higher reaches, we can think about it, but our main job is to get the second and third aspect together. We have, um, that's, an, that's an issue in our personality. That's an issue in our chain. That's an issue, you know, because we have the fourth uh, chain here relating to the third. It's basically love versus intelligence. That's an issue with the uh, solar system we have right now, the second major solar system and the previous major uh, third ray solar system. And it's, it appears to be an issue going on in the um, Big Dipper and the Pleiades uh, as they relate to Earth and our solar system. The second and third ray are out of adjustment. And that's our immediate task in just taking care of this mechanism, which has to be used in service on behalf of the planet. Just get those two things really together. And, and usually, they're just not. Not sufficiently. In other words, what I'm saying is our degree of soul infusion is insufficient as yet compared to what it could be. You know how it goes, 25% atomic matter, first initiation, and on and on, until by the time you take the fourth initiation, you've got 100% atomic matter, and you disappear. Okay, but there are other places to go, and uh, we really become effective at that time because there's a direct connection with the monad. So anyway, it doesn't make any difference what our ray may be. Soul ray, personality ray, it's the second aspect on the soul, and it's the third aspect on the personality, and they're out of adjustment. The lunar lords, oriented on the astral plane, etc., just have not been sufficiently transformed, and we have to do that before we can be effective with people. So the, the, those rays are hard to combine, and you know, because one is, in a way, so relatively objective, the third ray, obviously, and the other is so deeply subjective. So how do you combine your subjectivity with your objectivity? Sometimes do you ever kind of, uh, you know, look at the outer part of yourself, I mean, maybe we all do this, and we, f and we find something intangible within that's much more real. There it is. You've got it. Everything could fall on the floor and you'd still be right there, you know? All your outer instrumentation could go and you'd still be right there. So I suggest for all of us that we find the presence of the soul and realize temporarily that we are that and that we are that in a much bigger way than we are anything we usually identify with because we always identify, you know, you know, look in the mirror, it's how I feel, it's what I think. All those things are completely secondary. I, you know, you've got to get them in shape, of course, but they're secondary to that sense of identification of the director within. And unless we get that feeling of it, you know, I use the word feeling, okay. Unless we get that feeling of it, we're just not going to be able to identify subjectively. Because although these are the subtle bodies, you know, the etheric and the astral and the mental, they're subtle, but they're not subjective. And he makes a big deal about that, you know? So subjectivity is a different matter, 
And until we improve our subjectivity and function a lot less as if we're under the control of the outer instrumentation, we can only be limitedly helpful. And I, I would say, you know, that humanity in the next six years is going to need a lot of help. Okay, we did avoid some kind of world war so far. I mean, but obviously, obviously, there is an attack on, obviously. You know what I mean? The so-called last-ditch fight of materialism, it's obvious. And it's very subtle. <laughs> it's behind the scenes all the time. And you think that it's people that are really doing this, and they are because they're negatively related to these manipulative forces. The destroyer of souls, the deluder of souls, the manipulator of souls. Those types are working behind the scenes, and everybody gets an idea, and they, th they think it's their idea, and they defend it, and it's just crazy, you know. It's not the real thing at all. It's glamour and illusion. I guess what I'm trying to say is that as much as can be drawn out of us after all of our training, after so many years, the time is short to express those qualities with which we have been trained as effectively as we can in relation to those members of the human family who can be reached. So it's a new level of responsibility for everybody, I would say. Well, okay, soul-infused personality. What does it feel like to be infused by a presence? You know, I use that word, infuseception. You know, it's kind of, I like that word, but uh, there's a presence. isn't there? And it's everywhere the same. There's only one presence. And somehow that fusing factor, which not only is in all of us, but is all of us, is something we cannot neglect. It has nothing to do with personality whatsoever. It doesn't even have to do with soul, really. It, it has to do with being. And I think we should anchor ourselves there every day, five minutes, whatever it takes, if it takes, and anchor ourselves here at the same time. You know, the highest and the lowest meet. But every day, some time given to feeling the presence and recognizing that no matter what kind of variety you see in people and objects and all the surroundings, the presence is identical. And I think, I think that would really pay off, you know. I, I mostly practice that. If I get too busy, you know, okay. And we're all busy. But if we have the possibility to just sit down and zero in on the presence, which is everywhere the same in cosmos, of, of course. There are different intensities of registering the presence, right? I'm, I, it's one presence, but I'm sure a planetary logos or a solar logos is going to register this presence in a little bit more intense way than I am. You know what I mean? Uh, we, can't, we can't say, okay, once you achieve nirvana or some kind of uh, enlightenment, that's it. Same for all the gods. No, it's not the same for all the gods. It can't be because they just have so much more inclusiveness and sensitivity. So for them, the presence is a blazing thing that would absolutely destroy us if we could take it in that way. But we can take in something of the presence. And that presence is much bigger, much more important than anything we are, or seem to be, because it is what we are. Well, you know, around us, we see a lot of... Uh, personalities acting up. They, you know, they, maybe they've gotten as far as the fifth petal of the egoic lotus, and they're feeling their oats, you know. And they say, I am I. And they, you know, the, the tower in the tarot has not quite crashed down. The blasted tower, right? So if you just show too much ego, that tower is going to collapse, right? And then, you might just have enough humility after you shake off the dust 
to maybe become a humble aspirant in the latter part of that pedal. But we see a lot of ignorance, energized ignorance around us. I mean, you know, you, when I look at that uh, Charlottesville march, how can you distinguish that from what the Nazis were doing in Germany before it really took over? These people are absolutely infused by their elemental nature. And they're not in touch with any kind of higher power. It's a terrible thing. But expectable, you know, expectable. Pisces is not gone yet. And people don't know yet how to contact a higher power that shows them that, hey, wait, I'm a duality. What's going on here? There's a higher me and a lower me. So, and they're marching and fascism is coming back and DK warned about it and the fight is on again for all of us. So you see some pretty ugly things. You see a lot of, uh, you know, people, Venus can be, it looks like a mirror, right? You know, you, you, hold, you hold the mirror up and all you see is yourself. And uh, right in the middle of uh, your, your field of consciousness is this big fat self, you know. There it is. Well, you know, I always, I, I manage to say it almost every year. Master Moria calls the ego a ball of fat. So there it is in the middle of your field of consciousness. And, uh, and it's hard to see other things. It can just, megalomania is when it consumes your whole field of consciousness. And we've got some megalomaniacs running around out there. The time is ripe for them because people are afraid of the threshold of the new age. So they want to live below their diaphragm where they live for millions of years. So anyway, the megalomaniacs are arising. And basically it's a problem of, uh, well, I don't know, I hate to say it, but we're on the planet of uh, purifying pain and releasing sorrow and people just haven't suffered enough, you know. When, when the people who are busy screaming about their solar plexus have suffered enough, then they're teachable, you know, teachable. Every day I say, I say am I teachable yet? Okay, I'd like to be teachable. So there's all kinds of conflict that's going to go on here in internecine conflict, as DK calls it. You know, it's fight within the energy system before integration can occur. And we're going to see all this friction and ugliness based upon that fight. I mean, you know, a lot of the worst, uh, I'm looking at horoscopes of various countries, and I'm saying, why are these uh, negative traits of the horoscope showing up now? You know, I mean, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, I think that uh, U.S. has Mars and Gemini. Does it not? <coughs> Mars and Gemini. USA. So we shoot people in post office and schools and if they're jogging or wherever, you know, we, we take Mars, the gun, and we're just shooting people, okay? I mean, it could be the debate about the truth. It could be the higher and lower self trying to figure things out. But no, instead we take up a gun, uh, assault rifles, and we go out there and shoot the students. Well, you know, there's some pretty low responses that are possible to the national horoscopes. And uh, until people get a bigger picture, which is where we come in, you know, this spiritual propaganda effort that we're supposed to be doing, propagating the right ideas, okay? Until they get a bigger picture, they're just gonna hang on to that little picture, which allows them to just let the lunar lords run riot. We cannot allow that. And, and then, you know, paranoia is everywhere. Conspiracy theories everywhere. Why do, why do people get into that? Maybe it's a little more exciting than real life or something. But I, when I see those uh, suspicion, what, what do you say? Glamour. If there's self-pity, I could probably forget the one to which I'm susceptible. <laughs> if, 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 if there's... Um, Self-pity, suspicion, haha, and criticism. Those are the open doors to glamour. Those are the th three big open doors to glamour. Um, suspicion, ray one, paranoia. Uh, Self-pity, ray two. And criticism, ray three. And probably we could go down the list of the rays of 
attributes, and we could, uh, uh, we could find other doorways to glamour. But the whole world is rife with glamour right now. So can we be like, uh, you know, can we shine the light in such a way that we're really reliable and we're not going to fall victim to these kinds of uh, swirls going on all around us. We can be a steady and reliable beacon of light in the midst of all the swirling distortion and the misinterpretation. <sighs> I mean, you know, we have different, we, we have different backgrounds and we have different biases. I mean, is there anybody here that's unbiased? I want to see who you are. I want to talk to you about how you got that way. <laughs> a bias is a leaning, you know what I mean? So you, you, it, it, gravity is going to take you in a certain direction, w whether or not you intend to go that way. So we have to be, you know, on the level with each other, Libra, the level playing field, and somehow see things in proportion this, DK has just given us beautiful stuff. You know, the definitions of harmlessness and all that. The, if I get it right, the life expression of the man who uh, uh, lives consciously as a soul, who, uh, whose, nature is, who, whose nature is love. No, he says, the man who finds himself everywhere. So that's the very first occult hint. Whose nature is love whose method is inclusiveness, and for whom all forms are alike in that they veil and hide the light and are but externalizations of the one infinite being. I figure that's pretty good on harmlessness, you know. You just analyze any part of that. It's just amazing. So it really, you know, the, the disciples before World War II, let's say, did not really succeed. There just wasn't enough um, strength in them and not enough caring and a lot of distraction. And he said the war didn't have to precipitate, okay, if there had been sufficient. So I'm really hoping that we, as disciples, certainly not the only ones, because a lot of people are out there without all this esoteric knowledge doing great things. We know that. But we have a special responsibility to convey the quality of the hidden vision. You've, you've seen how he's gone over that in esoteric psychology, too. He says the, uh, uh, what does he say, something about the factor of synthesis, the urge for synthesis, the quality of the hidden vision. That's kind of a, every soul has it. But if we can convey that quality of the hidden vision, everything can change. But then again, you have to make sure you have it yourself, obviously. Then he gets in the urge to formulate a plan and the urge to the creative life and the factor of synthesis and two other things which he doesn't really give, but uh, um, I think he doesn't give them there. Maybe he does. Um, maybe idealism is there and uh, somehow realism, magical realism, he doesn't use those words. We have to be able to find these methods of inducing soul control. They're called methods of inducing soul control. So anyway, humanity is... Uh, could be a little happier right now, and joy does not pervade us, nor humanity as a, as a whole, due to all of these internecine conflicts. Sometimes, you know, um, it's just perpetual unhappiness and depression. And, and you know, when the soul is shining, those are not depressing moments. Those are very uplifting moments. You know, that Holy Spirit thing. and. You know, those are very high forces, very high forces. And I'm sure you've felt the exhilaration of what it means to be a, a student and practitioner of uh, early stages of occultism. You know, and he tells us about the Aquarian age and how they're subject to be manic depressive a little bit. And sometimes they're walking on the high hill and everything is sunny and God's in his heaven and all's right with the world. And the next thing you know, you're down in the depths. So we're going to have to face that quite a bit uh, in the coming age, but we should be not as subject to that. And he says, basically, we are, um, the form is withdrawing from the light when that happens. It's not that the light is unsteady, it's us. We can't take it. It's called the repression of the sublime, or maybe even the suppression of the sublime. 
we retreat. He says, I'd, I'd rather not see you as a flickering point of uh, unsteady approach, you know, something like that. I'd rather see you as a little beam that is steady and constantly approaching the greater light instead of on, off, on, off. Master Moria says, you're going to wear out your souls if you keep on doing that. You know, <laughs> friction on the floor, you know. Anyway, um, anyway, there must be a way. <laughs> so how do we really know when we put these uh, two together? This soul with all of its light and its unity, love, its sacrificial will, its sense of synthesis, its sense of immutable spiritual will at the very center of the jewel in the lotus. How do we know when we've done that? You know, um, well, maybe the triad will help somewhat, of course, and the monad eventually, but we don't maybe have to go that high immediately. We have to be aware of these things, but maybe not struggle there where we have not even fulfilled the lower requirement. These higher factors are introduced to give us a more complete picture, you know. But if we could just live a life in which goodwill was expressed as love in action, that would be quite good. That would be very, very good. Goodwill is love in action. And other people could find that contagious too. Can you imagine what the uh, vibration of the Christ is going to be like as he approaches? He has to be so careful. You know, it's really, the, the hierarchical vibration is so intense that they have to be careful how rapidly they approach. Because if you've got mud on your feet and you're climbing the ladder, he says, Zip, that's it, you're frozen. It cakes the mud on the ladder. And people, the average person, will have a very uh, negative response to the approach of a member of the hierarchy. And you probably recognize that yourself to a degree. If you try to talk to people about things that are just not what they're progressing towards, you know, they, they freeze or they, they go away. But I'm just thinking, you know, if the Christ walked in this room at the very moment, <laughs> be overwhelming, wouldn't it? Or don't you think so? I think it would be. But that's basically what's happening subjectively. The Christ is getting so close. Christ in the etheric, you know, astral, and now the intention as of 1945 to appear in a Maya Virupa and walk among men with the hierarchy preceding him. This is going to be a very intense time. And I just hope that we're all gearing up for the intensity. I've got a lot of things here about different solar systems, but I think I'll forego them. <laughs> We've got two things going on on our planet. The leftover lives from the moon chain didn't finish. And we have the planetary lord of the fourth chain and the planetary lord of the third chain kind of working together. At least that's the way I see it. And it's a very complicated situation. And a lot of us are um, moon chain types. You know, we've been steeped in the third ray and the subsidiary rays and certain kind of intelligence. And then there are people who are just up and coming in terms of the fourth chain. This is a big conflictual issue, and only real love in action, goodwill, real understanding, a degree of selflessness is going to solve this problem. I think, you know, I think that all of us, I'll speak for myself, all of us could be less selfish, more unselfish. We find little ways in which we are still selfish. And that is going to block the light. That's going to block the love. And it may hold us back from initiation. He oftentimes says, you know, this little problem unsolved, and it may be a very little thing, 
is that which is really holding the disciple back from initiation. So I, I guess my point here is that we have to be scrupulous about our condition and the kind of shape we're really in. We don't have Master DK writing letters to us right now, and a lot of those students couldn't stand it, you know, what he said about them. I mean the truth, you know. That's uh, hard to take. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the story is that Alice Bailey was always saying to him, hey, you can't say that, you know, kind of thing, because she was the Western woman, and she knew the sensitivities of the people in the West. But he says, in the beginning, he says, I'm going to write to you truth. I'm not going to worry about your personality. And then she kind of modified him a little bit along the way so they wouldn't all run out screaming. But, you know, to, to really see ourselves uh, in our imperfections. Okay, maybe we're not exactly on the probationary path. Maybe we've gone a little bit beyond that, but it never ends, you know. Even on the highest level you can fall back, says Master Hilarion. So we have to be so scrupulous, as I've said before from Moria, the smallest grain of sand can stop the largest wheel. So I guess what I'm calling for here, as this is evolving in my mind, is a higher level of tension in the coming years. You know what I mean? What is the point of tension? He gives the definition, focused, immovable will and it's revelatory. So if you hold a point of tension at various subplanes, more and more will be revealed to you. As the tension gets more intense, the revelation becomes more profound, and you become more and more useful. You want to be useful, right? I remember I was in Mary Bailey's office being interviewed. We all went through that, you know, when we came in to work in the, in the Arcane School, and uh, we were talking about a lot of things. And uh, she said, why are you here? Oh, that's a good one. So uh, I said, well, I'd, I'd like to be useful. And she says, good. Foster always said that. At least let me be useful. So I felt, okay, now I'm in. All right. <laughs> well, you know, it's a tough place to work, the Arcane School. Uh, it's, it's a lot tougher than you think, you know. It's, uh, there's a certain point of tension that is held. And I think all of us should be dedicated to improving or intensifying our point of tension, which means not being distracted from what the plan tells us we must do. Focused, immovable will. I, I, I certainly have my distractions, and they're often found in the kitchen. I don't know about yours. But anyway, if we, if we, if we find those things that lead us astray and off the mark, then we've just lowered our point of tension. And our points of extension, he says, are all over the body, 60% scattered. How can we, we be effective? So basically what I'm saying, are you as effective as you can be in terms of the plan? I want to see the person that raises their hand. I'll have a talk. Are you as effective as you can be? Well, I'm not. I, I know that. I really haven't met anybody that's as effective as they could be, you know what I mean. If they really took everything so seriously and yet sitting light in the saddle, you know, as Alice Bailey said, don't be the grim pill, the pill grim, you know. Just, uh, <laughs> you've seen that all the time. You get so serious about things that nobody wants to be around you. So, <laughs> but this question of how effective we are and how uh, serious we are and what kind of tension we're carrying. Now, you know, a conference like this, I know it's exhausting. I know it's exhausting. I purposely try to make it that way. <laughs> I know our board members are going to have words with me about this. But anyway, you know, I figure if we get together once a year, we better go for it, you know. So, just to sit down and uh, intensify your point of tension and get less distracted, have more revealed, be more connected, more integrated, more infused by the higher ethers, more anti whatever, and then be able to radiate that to people in modulated method to them, it would be a good thing. And I don't just know, I don't know anybody that's working up to their full capacity. I, I don't. 
Maybe I'm just blind, you know. But, and he basically says that. You think you're working up to your full capacity, he says. And then he denies it. We're not. Well, I've got to tell you, I've got a talk here, and I don't know where I am with it. It's just about over. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if anybody tried to put together this mosaic, I don't know what it looked like. But we're in the period when the secrets of the kingdom of heaven are supposed to be shouted from the rooftops. Or they would be. You heard, you've heard that old biblical thing, you know. So give me a rooftop, I'm ready, you know. And um, we have to, I remember what, uh, what Tuya said when she formed her organization long ago, uh, we will dare to call hierarchy by its name. You know, so, so we're oftentimes modifying everything so that other people don't get offended and all the rest of it. And Master Moria says, must we shout it in your ears, hierarchy, he says. I was attracted by that statement. I'm a real ear shouter, you know? And maybe some of you are too. I mean, you know, it's like, oh gosh, don't call people into your own court. He says that too. At the same time, something's happening on this planet which can save the day. And the graduates are reappearing and the fifth kingdom of nature is emerging. And we're going to have an entirely different civilization if we do it right. So every one of us has our part to help occultism win the day by the end of the 21st century. So I have a little thing here that says, what are the important things? Well, you know, for me, I can only speak for me in a way, but to take Master DK's teaching very seriously. It seems sometimes very far from worldly wisdom. Even, uh, you know, even for people like us, but it is the great reality. And at least if you're a pledged disciple, you know what is a pledged disciple? What is a pledged disciple? <laughs> I point to someone who knows what a pledged disciple is. You know, a pledged disciple, accepting disciple, disciple, pledged disciple, and accepted disciple, followed by initiate. And there's all these categories, and some people know them. Okay. But are you a pledged disciple? Have you made your promise? Are you keeping it? See what I mean? We should at least be that, the pledged disciple. And uh, during our best hours, which they register when they see us, who we are, that pledge should resound. It should resound. We are sworn to help. So take it seriously. It's the most important thing. Okay. We've got to, a few things here. We have to cultivate the spiritual will. Because even though it's far from being uh, really understood, it's absolutely necessary in these times. And there's so much opposition to progress in humanity. So remember, the battle is on right now. And someone said just the other day, the, the battle for democracy will be fought out in the United States. It's already happening. And it's going to happen all over the world. You want democracy? It's the hierarchical way of of uh, relating. Okay, it's not monarchy, it's not communism, it's democracy. It's an enlightened hierarchical democracy, as uh, Jose was uh, presenting to us. So we have to be part of that battle. That's what Master D.K. said. You remember that when he said, to see that you battle? You remember those words? Or are they repressed? <laughs> I always stop at that and say, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm ready, okay. So the, the, uh, the hierarchy has fought for democracy a long time, and we have to fight too. And then I'll just point us sort of in the end here to white magic where he gives us a process. Inquire the way, because you know the answers inside you. That doesn't mean you should refuse good advice, but you know, there's a lot of intuition in there. Obey the inward impulses of the soul no matter what, and that's a tough one, isn't it? Because there's the battle going on. St. Paul didn't always succeed, did he? Pay no attention to any worldly consideration. He actually says that. He says, refuse the advice of the worldly wise and follow the, those who are esoterically wise. That's tough too, isn't it? And live a life, well, this is the hardest one. I always come to this. Live a life which is an example to others. 
Oh my. You mean that person studied DK? Why is he acting that way? You know, we, we represent what we, where we gain our inspiration. And when they look at us and they say, oh my goodness, look how you're behaving. Look at your outward life compared to what the teaching says. Hypocrisy, you know, we get, uh, I wrote a song called Utopia, but I'm able to substitute many other words like hypocrisy in those first few notes. So live a life that is an example for others, and I think that's, that's really the toughest one. And, and somehow get the most out of yourself now. You know, the, I have a friend who said, well, we're like a turnip. You know how juicy a turnip is, right? So along comes the hierarchy and gives it a good squeeze and gets as much out of that turnip as it can. And we're all under the process of being turniped these days, last six years. Whatever you can get out of yourself, get it out of yourself. Now's the time for that. I have a final note that says, closing, whatever. OK, well, I'm there. <laughs> I've arrived at closing, whatever. And I've arrived at the end of my time. And uh, basically, what I'm saying to all of us is that we could do better than we're doing. Now, you know, that, that's not too good with pride. I mean, if you feel pretty good about yourself, then you don't want to hear that. But if we're honest, we could do better than we are doing. And we should apply ourselves to the task during these years closing out the forerunner. You know, next year, we'll have our fourth ray conference. It'll be a lot of harmony, beauty, and art. But there'll also be research into the principle of conflict. Why is all this conflict existing? Why are we the warring kingdom under the fourth ray? Why are we Scorpio when we could be Buddhic, you know? So I hope that the year brings for everybody a lot of beauty, a lot of understanding, a lot of resolution of conflicts, and, and a great deal more effectiveness wherever we try to uh, assist others. Because we're in the service business, right? And it's not easy to serve, as DK points out. but. Let everything good increase in us. That's what I would say. And of course, I'm talking to myself as I say it too, you know. Um, and then, you know, I always end up with what, what he says finally. He just, it's almost like his last words, work, my brothers. You know, he says, see that you battle and work, my brothers. Sounds like a nice secondary master, doesn't it? Well, he says, I have something of the first ray in my ethnic part of my triad. So, you know, we're not just eating with the second ray at all. Anyway, work, my brothers. Thank you.